I've got a question for you today. Are there any control freaks out there watching this feed right now? Maybe? Go ahead and say yes in the comments. I promise we won't judge you too harshly. <laughs> in fact, you know who you are, right? You need to know what's happening. You also need to know what has happened and what's going to happen, right? Details are your drug and perfection. Well, that's our aim, isn't it? You know, I myself am a recovering controlaholic. And now I say recovering because, you know, here's the deal. I just, I really can't understand what's wrong with knowing how things should go and then, and then um, wanting it to happen that way, right? Come on, people. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Today is the first Sunday in the season that we at the church call Advent. It's an interesting season, right? That weaves together the Easter promise of Christ's second coming and the anticipation of the celebration of the birth of Jesus. It's a time of waiting and of anticipation and preparation. It's a season of looking in two different directions, backward and forward at the same time. And it's enough to give anyone who's paying attention whiplash trying, and those who are trying to remain faithful to the church season. Now, as we prepare for the Christmas season, which by the way, technically the church defines as being from December 25th through January 5th, the 12 days of Christmas. You've probably heard the song, not 25 days. That's Advent, okay? Anyway, as we prepare, we look back at the birth of Jesus, at the dawning of a new light, the inbreaking of the kingdom of God into our world. Oh, it's a marvelous thing, right? We like this story a lot, right? It's a, it's a story that we know after all the details are recorded in scripture. And with the knowing, we feel we have probably some level of control. Little baby Jesus, born in a stable, placed in a manger under a star, cattle lowing, Mary loving, lovingly pondering, shepherds admiring. We know this story, right? And it makes for all the good feels, right? What's not to love about this story? The other direction we look is not so precious, not so well-defined, mainly because it hasn't happened yet, right? It's elusive. It's the one where we look forward to Jesus' eventual return in glory, to establish his kingdom once and for all. It's ambiguous, really, and it's not at all under our control. We don't like that not knowing, do we? Which is probably why we jump so quickly to the, the nativity at this time of year, right? How many of you, let me ask this question, how many of you have set out your Jesus' second coming decorations? <laughs> Does your home look like a scene from the Tim LaHaye and, and uh, uh, Jerry B. Jenkins' Left Behind ser series of books? You know, those post-rapture scenes, um, a complete set of clothing uh, artfully placed where the faithful have departed from. Uh, a now driverless car crashed into a tree in your front yard. A kitchen mixer spinning uh, merrily out of control, spewing flour all over everything because the person running it is no longer there to turn down its speed. Maybe, maybe a Jesus descending from the clouds quilt hanging on your wall. No? Tis the season, right? I jest only in part, right? The waiting for a someday unclear what it'll really be like return is unsettling to us as people. We don't like the unknown and the out of our control. And yet, it is arguably the most important aspect of this season, the waiting 
the preparing, even in the midst of the not knowing and the out of the control. Advent asks us to look at something that is out of our control. You know, the traditional scripture passage that the Church Universal asks us to address on this first Sunday of Advent points us directly at this uncomfortable reality. It's the voice of Jesus speaking to his disciples in the last week of his earthly life. Listen to this passage from Matthew 24, verses 36 through 44. Jesus speaking again. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, mar marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. <laughs> wow, no baby Jesus meek and mild here, is there? Just Jesus laying it out for his disciples and for us. If you think about it, the disciples, along with all of Israel, right, were waiting too. They had been waiting for a long, long time. They were waiting for the coming of the promised Messiah, just like we're waiting for the promised second coming of Christ. The one who would return uh, and who would come and turn everything around, who would establish his kingdom. His disciples were beginning to recognize that Jesus was the one for whom they had been waiting. Others, not so sure. And still others, oh, they were absolutely sure that he was not. You might recall that final week in Jerusalem, Jesus' teachings were stirring the people up quite a bit. They were creating a storm. The crowds loved him. They heard his words and they saw his signs and they believed, or at least that's what it looked like to those who were in power, right? Those in power, on the other hand, were nervous. You know, the control freaks. Power, prestige, control. And that must not happen because this Jesus, if this Jesus guy were to throw everything over, and so they tested him over and over that week, trying to discredit him, to keep their hold on control. Can you imagine? It was a vicious game of theological gotcha, if you will. One wrong answer and gotcha. They would have what they would need to get rid of him once and for all, to regain their grip on control. Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They asked him. Or suppose a man, uh, suppose a man dies with no children and all of his brothers marry his wife in succession and none of them have children. Whose wife will she be, Jesus, in the resurrection? Or teacher, what is the greatest commandment? So many landmines, right? One wrong step and gotcha. These men, these, these Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and priests were afraid. What would the coming of the Messiah look like? They didn't know any more than we know today. Jesus was suggesting, well, actually saying, that the, that the current order would be turned on its head. Now, if that were true, if he were, in fact, the Messiah, everything would change. And they'd have no say 
and how that change would, would come about or what would happen to them. And that must not happen. Cause, because, well, because of control. So later, later that evening, Jesus is with his disciples. The temple is left behind for a little while. And Jesus is trying to explain to his disciples what was going to happen in the days to come. And at one point, someone asked Jesus when it would be. When was the new kingdom finally to come? You know, they were, they were ready, right? Now, Matthew tells a lot about what Jesus said. But in short, what he said was, my father is the only one who knows and he's not talking. What is important is that you be ready for whenever it does happen. And the men in power and even some of the disciples thought that that being prepared meant being ready to fight that the new kingdom would be similar to earthly kingdoms right that and in that its establishment would be uh, passed based on excuse me based on the violent overthrow of power and and corruption and and foreign foreign oppression this was something that they knew about right violence and fighting and and conquering right and it made them feel like they were in control so we can kind of understand that we muster the troops we ready the arms we we drop the plans and we attack we know something about that don't we sounds a bit like a governor's race or a, a senate campaign or local school board elections sounds like Sounds like family dynamics and neighborhood disputes and maybe holiday planning. Being ready for this Jesus, however, and for his kingdom, well, there isn't any of that. Boy, and that made them nervous, didn't it? You know what it does look like? And it's not Christmas lights and decorations as lovely as those are. I love all that stuff too. Hear me when I say that. But it's not that. Being prepared for Jesus' coming looks like loving God, right? About gathering together in worship, reading God's word, practicing the faith, and proclaiming the truth. And it looks like loving our neighbors, feeding the hungry and clothing the, the naked, uh, seeking justice and, and equity for the oppressed, making our world better, more kingdom-like. I realize that it's tempting to rush to Christmas. I love that feel-good feeling too, but we mustn't skip over the in-between. We mustn't bypass that, that uncomfortable feeling of not knowing. Not knowing is terrifying, I get that. Unless, unless that is, you know the one who is coming, unless you know Jesus. Not the baby Jesus, meek and mild, safe and antiseptic in the manger on our mantle or under our tree. Not that Jesus. He's sweet, but not much more than ho a hope yet, right? I'm talking about the Jesus who cared enough about a, a poor young newlywed couple on their wedding day celebration. Uh, he cared enough to supply more wine, really good wine, lest they should look bad in front of their family and neighbors. I, I'm talking about the Jesus who, who looked on the sick and the, the afflicted with compassion and was moved to heal them that they might be whole. I'm talking about, about the Jesus who, despite his disciples' slow understanding and weak spirits, never gave up on them, not for a minute. I'm talking about the Jesus who would refuse to do anything that could contradict his word of love, including laying down his life so that instead of returning violence for violence, this is the Jesus, friends, who will return. It is, he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so we don't have to be afraid of not having any control about when Jesus will come. We might not know what his final return will look like. I'm pretty sure we can assume that it will look nothing like, uh, look nothing like the Left Behind series, 
It was an entertaining book, but nothing more. We may not know if we will be transported to some new heaven or whether a new Jerusalem will in fact come down here on earth. In the end, really, it doesn't matter. What matters, friends, is that we know and we trust in the one who will bring it about, who says, I will come back. Here's the deal. Christmas is out of control, right? Commercial, uh, commercial Christmas, anyway. And we probably can't do much about that. The second coming of Christ is also out of our control. It's God's plan, not ours. So maybe go ahead and, if you must, and plan your Christmas. Plan your parties and plan your days for another Merry Christmas, another controlled Christmas. But also, be ready. Be ready for Christ will come again. And thanks be to God, it will be gloriously out of our control. Amen? Amen. Our ever-present God, we reflect on Christmas as a time of year that celebrates the coming of our Savior, Jesus. Thank you for the ultimate gift of your saving Son who came to live among us. We admit that during this time of year, we have turned this time of joyful reflection into a stressful time of worrying about how to make a perfect Christmas happen. Slow our pace as we reflect on the important things in our life. Help us as we reflect on our priorities, resources, and our abilities to open our eyes to the preciousness of the life that you've given us. Help us to live in the present as we see you at work in our neighborhood and world and strive to join along with you. Calm our busy minds and bodies. Lead us by the still waters that bring us peace and refreshment. As you work in us, you give us a new perspective in life. Provide clarity to interruptions or accidents in life that help us to know how to handle those situations. Thank you for being our ever-present God. We rest in the reassurance that we have our home with you, no matter how tough, confusing, or frustrating life gets. God, you get us. You guide us and you love us. We pray for the opportunities to share your connection and love with those around us. Amen.